Welcome, COLG family. Uh, so glad that you guys could join us tonight for your Wednesday night. This is our midweek infusion, and um, it's a little different than what we were doing uh, just a few short weeks ago, but you know, all that's kind of out, out of our control right now. Uh, but welcome, so glad that you're tuning in. I hope that you're, you're safe, I hope that you're healthy. Been praying, uh, the pastoral team has been praying especially for our people and praying for health and protection and blessing and favor and there's so much uncertainty right now and uh, I believe that's kind of what has fueled what God has put on my heart for today. And so um, I wanna talk to you tonight about purpose and I think it's important that we as the people of God do not uh, neglect or forget our purpose even in things like this. I, I realize that for virtually all of us that we're in unprecedented, uncharted territory. Uh, we've never been through pandemics and shutdowns like this in our lifetime, but I think the fact remains that uh, what we hold to be true, what we hold to be real about God and His presence in this world, His activity in this world, has to remain even in things like this, even in the unknown. And I think uh, what we have to consider is that uh, there were so many unknowns in Scripture that the stories that we read about now as fact, um, that we read about afterward and we see what God was doing, that in those moments His people did not see necessarily what He was doing. That is so obvious to us now, right? You know, they say hindsight's twenty twenty. Well, in that, that hindsight that we're going to have, we're going to see what God was doing even in this crisis, even in this time. And so uh, I want us to look at purpose tonight. I want us to think about what does purpose mean? What is, what is the perspective of purpose according to Scripture, particularly um, when it comes to the people of God? Because we all have this awareness, this keen sense that God has something for us. And He had something for us from the foundations of the world. And He has something for us beyond COVID-19. Uh, he was preparing us up until this moment to go, to go through this moment. And there's purpose at work. And if we neglect and, and ignore that purpose, then we are, uh, we are probably putting ourselves in a bad position, right, for the long term. So I want to call this message Perspectives on Purpose. And I want to start in what is probably the most well-known uh, verse about purpose or containing the term purpose in Scripture. And that is in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. Not exactly a place you typically start at in a sermon, uh, but it is something that has some powerful truth in it, okay? So we're going to read from the New King James Version, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. It says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. I think that we have to acknowledge, we have to recognize um, as we grow, as we grow up, we begin to see and, and recognize that life is seasonal. You hear pastors say it all the time. Life is seasonal. And if, if we treat every single thing that we ever encounter as permanent, then we're going to have a very tumultuous life. But if we begin with the realization in every season that it's just a season, then we're going to be in better shape than what uh, the, the many people around us usually are in those situations. So many folks in our culture take everything, every blow, every wind, everything that is contrary that comes at them, they take it as permanent. They take it as this ultimate, some people take it as an ultimate sign that they shouldn't go a direction. Some people take it as this uh, mindset shaping force that says that everything and everyone is against me. But it's not always the case, is it? Life is seasonal. To everything there is a season. Everything has a season. It can be a good season, it can be a bad season, but either way, it's a season. You know, and seasons pass. I've said this for years, you know, it might pass like a kidney stone, but it's still going to pass. Seasons come and seasons go. Life is seasonal, but nothing in this life is permanent. Nothing in this life is permanent. It says uh, not only is life seasonal, but it says that there is a time for every purpose under heaven. So when it says to everything there is a season, that, that whole phrase in English in the original Hebrew is just one Hebrew word, and that word means an appointed occasion or time. So if life is seasonal and those seasons are appointed, that changes the whole meaning. It changes the whole experience for us. Because if it's appointed, that means it was known. doesn't mean it was known by us, but it was known by the one who appoints. So... 
to everything there is a season, an appointed occasion or time. If we are people of faith and we neglect to believe that God was not aware of every season that comes and goes in our life, then we're not much in, our, in terms of our faith, are we? But people of faith have to recognize that if, there, if there's a season for everything, an appointment for everything, then God is still on his throne. He is still aware. He is very present in our times of trouble. He knows what's going on. Nothing has removed him. Nothing has taken him by surprise. So to everything there is a season, an appointed occasion or time. It, that means it was appointed to come and it was appointed to go. Because that, that term, a time, right after the comma there, a time means time, it means after, and it means a due season. So if there's an appointed occasion for every time, for everything, and then the after is for every purpose under heaven, then that, that believes, or, or I'm sorry, that leads us to understand and believe that there is always an after to the appointment. There's an appointment that comes. There's an appointment that God was aware of. There was something that was arranged, but there is a season of after. There's a season of living in the aftermath of that appointment. See, there, there are appointments that God schedules for us that we miss sometimes. There are appointments that God schedules for us that we uh, purposely miss because we don't want to necessarily be a part of the direction he's taking us. But I think most of the time we miss it by accident. I think most of the time we fail to recognize the time that we're in. Uh, the season that we're in, what God's trying to do. But regardless, there's an after that follows. And, and that's really the pattern. The pattern is appointment and then after. But it's during the after that you live in your purpose. See, the appointment was scheduled for a reason. The, the, the appointed season came for a reason. And it's passing. And as it passes, there is a purpose that is trying to be accomplished. Even in the lives of believers, even in the midst of chaos, even when everything is crazy and unprecedented and uncharted, it does not mean that God was unaware, but in fact it means that the appointment has come and now we're living in the after. Uh, he goes on um, in verse 2, it says, A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. See, the purpose is in the after. The purpose is played out in the gaps. In verse 2, we see a time to be born. That's an appointment. And then we see a time to die. That's the next appointment. In between being born and dying, there's purpose. There's purpose that is being played out. The after. After being born, you live in purpose. Then you, you reach that appointment of death. It's appointed to every man wants to die. And then after, there's a purpose in it because we get to go into our heavenly home. We get to go and be with our Father in His house and live out a new existence that we don't yet fully know what it will be. It says there's a time to plant and there's a time to pluck what is planted or to harvest it. So you plant, that's an appointed season. And then there's purpose in that season because in that season what you've planted grows and matures and becomes more. And then there's a time to harvest what you've been planted. There's a time for that, that, that thing that you planted to, to become part of you, to become in you, okay? Verse 3 says a time to kill and a time to heal. So there's a, a time to kill. I believe this is referencing battle. Um, and then there's a time to heal. There's a time to rebound. There's purpose in that gap. So purpose is in the gaps. So I'm talking about perspectives on purpose, according to the scriptures, right? So we, we see that life is seasonal. We see that... Time and purpose go hand in hand to everything. There's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. So there's, there's that connection there and that that purpose plays out in those gaps in our life. We have an appointment, we have a gap, and then we have another appointment. In that gap is where the purpose plays out. If we go to um, Ezra chapter 4 verse 1, we come into a story where the people of God have come back into their homeland uh, the first, this is the first group of um, exiles that have returned after the Babylonian, the Babylonian captivity. They're returning under the orders of Cyrus, king of Persia. And uh, it, it says in verse 1, it says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to him since the days 
of Eshar Hadan, king of Assyria, who brought us here. So these were people who were not native to the, to the land of, of Israel, but they were brought here under the captivity of, a, of an Assyrian king. And they go to Zerubbabel, and they say to him, him and Yeshua, they say, hey, let us help you build the temple to the Lord your God, because we worship the same God you do. But Zerubbabel, verse 3, and, and Yeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers of the houses of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as, king, as Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Now, that sounds kind of harsh. There's a whole lot more to unpack into that. But what we see here is we see the people of God coming back into their purpose in this season, and they're beginning to, to live it out. They've, they've reached this appointment, okay, where they have been returned to their land. God told them 70 years prior that when 70 years is up, you're coming back, and I've got something for you to do. Now, again, it was uncharted territory. It was new for them. They'd never, many of the people that had come back with Zerubbabel, including Zerubbabel, um, they, they were not uh, native to Israel. They had not grown up there. They did not know the land of their heritage. Uh, but they have come back, and they're doing the purpose. They've had the appointment, and now they're living in the purpose of that appointment. Okay, And these people have come to interfere. And we see that because what we see is that their heart was not really to help. Their heart was to do something else entirely. Verse 4 says, The people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building. Verse 5 says, And they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So I want to show you something. We, we talked in, in Ecclesiastes about this purpose playing out in the gaps. We should never uh, be in a gap season, th that gap, and ignore the purpose. God is doing something in the gap, okay? He's doing something in that gap from the appointment until the next appointment. He's working his purpose in that time. But now we see the people of God living that out. They're in this, this gap season. The appointments come. All right, we're back. Now it's time to move into what? We're here to do what God has purposed for us to do. And some people come along and they interrupt the work. I want to show you that the purpose of God is often work in the life of the believer. The purpose of God is often work. Do not be deceived into thinking that God will drop anything of worth into your lap. Uh, I've been serving the Lord a long time now, 25 years almost. And in that time, in that time, God has never dropped anything of substance into my lap. He, he sought me. He saved me because he was looking for me. And he is sanctifying me. I say is because it's still happening. I'm still working on me. And he is still working on me. And anything of worth and of value in the kingdom of God takes time. And anything of worth and value in the kingdom of God is work. It's work. Jesus himself did not step his foot on the earth and walk into his purpose immediately. It took 30 years before he uh, became the man that he was meant to be so that he could become our Messiah. 30 years. Most people say if it doesn't take a, you know, a year or two, it's too long. God, God, what's the delay? What's the delay? Well, in fact, I would say that if there's a delay, if there's a gap in there, it's because God's got a grand purpose that he's working between your appointments. The people of God are living in this, this season they're working out their purpose because purpose is work. It says they troubled them in building. The people of God were building, but they were troubled in their purpose. It says they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. I don't know if you've ever been frustrated before. I get frustrated sometimes. I've been frustrated in this season. If I can be completely transparent and honest with you, I have been frustrated in this season, uh, this season of, of lockdown and quarantine uh, for many reasons. But one thing I've struggled with in particular is just uh, not having the things to do that I normally go to, you know, not having the outflow that I normally have uh, with the word and with being able to engage with students and, and with people. And, you know, we're sending cards out and we're dropping quarantine packs off to youth and we're, we're, we're making connections online. We're doing things, but it's just not what I like, right? And it's been frustrating. And, and these people were in very much a similar situation. They were doing what God wanted them to do. They were doing the work, the purpose that he had put in them to do. And yet they were frustrated because there were adversaries who come along. Now, why 
Why have we believed the lie that because we're doing the work of God that we would do it untroubled? That we would do that work without any, any resistance on the part of the enemy or on the part of people? Jesus said that the people of the world will not, they'll not know us, they'll not love us, they won't understand us because they don't know Him. And yet we're so surprised as Christians when people don't love us and when people don't agree with what we're doing. We're so surprised. But it's in the Word. Adversaries show up to frustrate you in your purpose. But does that mean you've got to give up on your purpose? If there is purpose working out between appointments, to everything there's a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven, the time and the purpose, there's a, there's a point for it all, and we move from one appointment to the other. But if we allow the adversary, any adversary, sometimes it's not even the devil. Sometimes it's your spouse. Sometimes it's your kids. Sometimes it's you resisting, frustrating yourself in, in the purpose that God has put in you. If we allow that to happen, we are undermining ourselves. We are, we are allowing the enemy to try to stop the purpose of God. Now, what's, what's cool, if you go on and read the rest of Ezra and into Nehemiah, you see that although the people came to frustrate, and although the people lied about Zerubbabel and Yeshua and Nehemiah and so many of the others, even though they lied, the, the people of God continued their work to the point where at one point they were building with one hand and they had a sword in their other hand. They were ready to go to battle. Okay, They didn't stop in their purpose. They could have. Lots of folks would have, but they did not. And in the end, they were able to finish and, and finish the wall and rebuild the temple. It took years, but they were able to do it because they would not give up on the purpose that God had given them, even though it was work and even though it was frustrated by adversaries. They would not stop. And what's amazing is, is that the, the wall that they built, there's still remnants of today in Israel. When Pastor went to Israel several years ago now, it's been, it's been a while, eight or nine years ago, he, he took pictures of Nehemiah's wall. The wall that they built is still there. You know what? The adversaries aren't there anymore. The people who wish them ill are not there anymore. The builders themselves are not there anymore, but the purpose of God was so big and so great that it has outlasted millennia beyond what uh, those people were living in in the moment. So we cannot allow our momentary frustration, our momentary exhaustion, our momentary adversaries to keep us from living out and living in the purpose that God has, has put for us. In Ecclesiastes 3, verse 17, it says, I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every purpose and for every work. He's repeating himself again. God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for, for every purpose and for every work. A perspective on purpose here in this verse. It shows us that God's purpose works in the righteous and the wicked. Listen, if you think that God can't use wicked people, you don't know our God. He can clearly use wicked people. He used wicked people all throughout Scripture. He promises us that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. There's times where we, we would label somebody as wicked, but God labels them as a servant. He called Nebuchadnezzar a servant. He called Cyrus a servant. He prophesied Cyrus's reign 150 years through the mouth of the prophet Isaiah, 150 years before he ever came into power. If we don't think that God can use wicked people, we've got to readjust our, our perspective. God can use anybody. God can work a purpose through anybody, through righteousness or wickedness. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. Sometimes it feels like the wicked are the ones who are doing what they want, who are prospering, as David said over and over through the Psalms. The wicked prosper, but here I am. You know, it feels like they're the ones who are wreaking havoc in the world. They're wreaking havoc in our world personally. But God can work purpose even through the wicked. Even through the wicked. Even through you when you're wicked. I know I shouldn't say that. We're church family here. But it's true. Sometimes we're wicked. And yet God works purpose through us in our wickedness. 
So let's not allow wickedness to be the barrier. We can't say, oh, there's, there's evil people in power and so we can never see the purposes of God fulfilled. No, no. Who is so wicked that their wickedness is greater than the goodness of our God? There is no one. There is no one on that level. So let's give that one up. But it also shows us that God will judge the purpose that he works, even through the righteous and the wicked. So that's great news for us as the righteous. That's great news because it tells us that God's going to judge the wicked. And we like it when God judges the wicked. But we're ignoring the fact that it says that God will judge the righteous and the wicked. He's going to judge us in our purpose too, in our fulfillment. God is a righteous judge, and he's going to judge the purposes that he's working out between our appointments. He's going to judge it on the wicked. He's going to judge it on the righteous. So let's fulfill the purposes. We cannot forget where we were. Just because things came to a stop or went a different direction from where we were a few months ago does not mean that God's not still working a purpose. We can't see it. We may not see it yet right now, but it doesn't mean that he's not working a purpose. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 6 says, Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. Listen, if we, if we fail to fulfill the purposes of God, there's misery for us. That doesn't mean we're going to go to hell. I'm not saying that kind of misery. What it means is that we're going to fall short. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to stand before my father someday, and I want him to say, You've been faithful in the little that I gave you. Now be, be a ruler over much. Or enter in into the joy of your Lord. That's what I want to hear. But there's going to be things that I failed on. There's going to be things that you failed on that we have failed on. And I want to minimize that as much as possible. But God judges everyone's purpose. Let's not neglect that fact. If we have reached an appointed time and we're living in the after, and the, the after is where the purpose plays out, if we're living in that, we have to understand there's going to be an account for it. But thank God we know the one who's giving an account. Thank God he's righteous. He's our father. He loves us. And if anyone can help us fulfill it, it's him. And if anybody wants to help us fulfill it, it's him. John 12, 27, this is Jesus uh, in the New King James Version. It says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Have you ever said that to the Lord? <laughs> Have you ever said that to somebody? I don't know what to do, man. I'm just troubled. Things are or, or, or I'm frustrated. Things are messing me up. Things aren't going the way they should be going. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? And he's, he says this. This is a rhetorical question that Jesus asks. He says, Father, save me from this hour. My soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Jesus was acutely aware of where he was in the season. The apostles and the disciples, they didn't have quite that awareness. There was a time where they said, Jesus, now will you restore to Israel the, the kingdom? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the, the times and the seasons. You guys, you're missing it. You're missing it. But in fact, it, he wasn't saying that we can't know. But he's saying that, guys, you're missing it. So in this season, in, in this verse, in John 12, 27, Jesus is very aware of where he's at in the appointment, in the schedule. Okay? He, he's very aware of the milestones that he's hitting and the, the after. He's, he's aware of what purpose he's living in. And he says, my soul's troubled, but should I ask God to save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. How many, how many hours have we gone through? How many times have we come into throughout our journey? And, and I'll say this, I've done this too where we're saying, God, save us from this. But God's saying, but this is why I brought you here. How many, how many times have we gone to God and said, God, save me from this hour. I can't bear this hour. And God's saying, you can bear this. I made you for this hour. I made you for this hour. This is why you are here. Church of the living God, we have to recognize that we were made for this hour. If we are in this hour, we were made for it. He did not drop the ball. He did not mess up in putting us here. He did not uh, uh, get it wrong by assembling this group of people together in this time. No, he, he put us here for this hour. We came to this hour for a reason. So let's not ask God to save us from this hour. Let's ask God to uh, allow us to fulfill our purpose in this hour. God, don't, don't take me out of it. If it's where I'm supposed to be, don't take me from it. 
Don't take me from it. Instead, take me through it into the purpose that you have for me. Jesus was aware and his purpose, his sense of purpose completely overrode his trouble. He said, guys, my soul is troubled. That's a big admission from our Lord and Savior. But he chooses to let his purpose override his trouble. How could that change your situation? Talk about a perspective change. How could that change this season that we're in with your work? I'm laid off too, so I understand. With your work and with your family, with everything that's going on with school and work and and the country and all this stuff that's happening, how can it change our perspective if we look around and say, you know what, God, I don't need you to rescue me. I need you to shine through me. God, I need you to move in purpose through me. God, use me in this season. Don't let me just sit at home on my behind and waste time, but instead let me recognize that your purpose is bigger than my trouble. Your purpose is bigger than what I'm afraid of right now. It's bigger than our uncertainty. Purpose overrides trouble. It's okay to be troubled. Just don't let it override your purpose. In fact, override the trouble with your purpose. Romans 8, 28, and I'll be finished. It's a familiar passage. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to God. To his purpose. Now there's a couple things happening here. We've got God working things together for good. For those who love him. Those who love him are those who are called. The called according to his purpose. Anytime you see that word call. Calling, called, whatever in scripture. It's an invitation. So God puts out an invitation. We reach an appointment. And we begin to live out a purpose. That's our invitation in that season. If we choose to accept the invitation, then he will work everything else out. When we accept God's invitation to our purpose, the appointment, he works everything else out. He takes care of it all. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If we accept the invitation, we know that all things work together for the good, for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. If I'm in my purpose, I'm in the safest place I can be. If you're in your purpose, you're in the safest place that you can be. If we as a church are in our purpose, we are in the safest place that we can be. We cannot give up. We cannot say, oh, my soul's troubled. God, take me out. Oh, my soul's troubled. I can't do this. No, instead, we were made for this hour. We were made for this hour, and if we were made for this hour, and we accept that truth, that invitation, that we've been called for now, then he will work everything else out. He'll take care of your finances. He'll take care of your kids. He'll make sure you've got food. Church, we have to believe that. We have said it and said it and said it up until this season. And if it's not true, then we've been deceiving ourselves. Either it is true or it is not. That he is able and willing to help us even in times of trouble. To be present when things are going crazy. To to take care of everything else when we seek him first. Either it's true or it's not. Some perspectives on purpose. Yeah, life is seasonal. There's a purpose. There's an appointment. There's an occasion. There's, There's an after We have an appointment, we have the after. And in that after, that gap between appointments, we have purpose playing out. The purpose is in the gaps. Don't miss it. Don't sit in a gap with your arms folded and say, God, what are you doing? Why why is nothing happening? Why is nothing happening? There's a purpose in this. God's doing something that we just don't see yet. We just don't understand yet. We can be troubled in our work because purpose is work. We can be frustrated by our adversaries but it does not negate the purpose of God in our life. We can be comforted by the fact that God is going to judge the purpose that he is working in the righteous and the wicked. And we can let our purpose override our trouble. It's okay to be troubled. It's okay to be afraid sometimes. Just don't take on that spirit of fear. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. And then we have to accept God's invitation. And as we accept that invitation into purpose, God takes care of everything else. Either it's true or it's not. I believe it's true. 
I believe my experience to this point has proven to me that it's true. Hopefully your experience to this point has proven to you that it is true as well. Let me pray over you, church, before we go. Okay, we've hit our time limit. Let me pray over you. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this house. God, I know. I know that we're in uncharted territory. But God, it's not uncharted for you. That you are aware that you knew it was coming. That you've been speaking and leading and, and you were leading this house and these people that make up this house. You were leading us in the right direction. God, you started us off this year teaching us about prayer. Prayer that makes a difference on Wednesday nights. And then, God, you taught us about community. God, what it means to be a body. It was so strange that you were leading us that way. But now I see why you were leading us that way. Because you knew that we were about to be separate. We were about to be separated, a body spread out across geography. But you knew that, that before we went there, we needed to understand what we were to each other. And how much we're going to value that when we come back together. And God, you started talking to us about the kingdom. And what the kingdom is all about. And God, I believe it's for a purpose. There's a purpose that you are working even in this. And God, we'll do it like, this, like the song says, Lord, that even when I don't see it, I know you're working. Even when I can't feel it, I know that you're working. And you never stop working for us, God. So God, we take comfort in your purpose tonight. We understand that you are for us, you're with us. That your purpose is not null and void because things went a little off the rails from our perspective but it's not off the rails from your perspective. God, we trust you. We love you. God, I speak blessings over this, these people. God, I speak favor and healing, uh, health in their life. God, I speak protection in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask that this plague would not come near our dwelling. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you, church. We're grateful for you. And uh, hang in there. We're going to be back together soon. And I'm looking forward to it.